we have uh, now officially kicked this off. So this is a video that we're going to be not only broadcasting live to all of the participants of the ABS hackathon, we're also recording this. So if you are in the hackathon and you missed it, you'll be able to watch this later. And then we're also going to throw it up on, on YouTube uh, later on as well. So the whole point of this is that we're going to be just introducing ABS development. It's going to be fairly introductory level. So if you've already built something sophisticated, you might not learn a whole lot. You still might learn a little bit. A little bit. Um, we have the ABS team here, uh, Nima and Sam, and they're going to be giving presentations. And I'm going to also be giving a, a quick presentation on the Hello World. So to start things off, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Nima, who's going to kind of uh, talk about AVS development and some things that he's working on. Appreciate it, Nader. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to uh, share my screen real quick here to go over some guides that we have, starting with this. So um, this will give you a, a high level sense of um, what ABSs are and how you can start conceptualizing um, the development for them. So what, what you can think of ABSs is they're just apps on top of Ethereum, right? Um, and these apps are operated by um, a set of operators who effectively have access to the full hardware resources um, of these operators outside of the EVM. And it just so happens that um, for the verification of the work that these ABSs do, there's a specific protocol that, that they um, define, right? And if this verification um, protocol is not run correctly, then these operators end up losing their stake as a result. And some examples of these are you know, data availability layers, virtual machines, keeper networks, oracles, and so on and so on. Um, but to give you a more concrete sense, we're gonna go through a visual guide of how the various different uh, components fit together. Here we give a high level snapshot of um, what the current ecosystem looks like. So we have the stakers, we have some contracts here, we have some other contracts here, and here we have the off-chain components of what the various operators are doing and how um, dApps, both off-chain and on-chain, can interact with um, ABSs. So without further ado, let's dive into who the actors are. So we primarily have three actors, stakers, operators, and ABSs, and we're gonna jump into who the stakers are. So you have uh, this role who essentially has some funds, whether it's LSTs or native ETH, and the way that they primarily interact with Eigenlayer is deposit funds, withdraw, delegate to an operator, and undelegate. And the way this happens is that Eigenlayer core protocol has one set of uh, smart contracts. that are the strategy manager, delegation manager, and ABS directory. These are important contracts for you to know about because when you're developing your ABS, um, you will need to know how your ABS contracts interact with these core uh, set of contracts. Um, yeah, so when a staker uh, interacts with Eigenlayer, they're specifically interacting with a strategy manager. And what a strategy manager does is uh, it, it defines what a strategy is and uh, how it's how it's rel how it's defined relative to the stake that the staker deposits. And all strategies are are how assets are modeled in Eigenlayer. So it's just the type of assets and the amount. And here you can see that the exact interface for that is just an ERC twenty and the amount. And it's similar with the, with the withdraw. Um, and yeah, this is this is the function that gets called. Um, this is stuff that you are not gonna uh, really um, go through as a developer of an ABS, uh, but it's important for you to know, as I said, um, how assets are deposited and how they're handled by what by the core contracts. Same thing with the delegation manager. When a staker uses uh, funds to um, deposit, um, they need to delegate that fund, undelegate that, and, and withdraw and then withdraw the funds. And they interact with the delegation manager. Um, and again, the interface walks through how this is done. Um, and this is also the contract that uh, operators can use to uh, opt into uh, the protocol. So when an operator uh, ends up registering with Eigenlayer and stakers can delegate to an operator, and um, we need to know what an operator exactly does. So what operators do are uh, they're the type of user who has some hardware and uh, wants to use this hardware to make money. And they do this by registering with Eigenlayer to enter a job market to perform various services. The important thing to note though here is that these services want to ensure that the operators are doing the job that they said they would correctly. 
And if they don't do that, some amount of uh, bond will be taken away. And that's that's the stake that, that would eventually get slashed if it happens. So you can think of this as, um, again, these off-chain actors or the operators here, they interact with like in their core contracts by calling the delegation manager who then end up uh, um, being the source that you check for uh, if an operator is registered to um, be able to take on yeah, your, your service uh, functionality. And this is the uh, function that they call uh, when they're trying to register. Um, and you can use Eigenlayer like, CLI to end up um, registering as an operator. This is important for you um, as later on uh, when you're registering as an operator yourself on, on testnet perhaps uh, to test your own functionality before onboarding other operators. So you can go through the end-to-end -end flow of um, actually enabling your, your service to be tested on Holski. And, and the same thing happens here. Uh, for you to become a staker yourself, and then if you have an operator yourself, um, you can use this flow to um, end up delegating. The, the, this is the function that, that gets called when a staker wants to delegate to, a, to an operator. And you can see this. Uh, what, what's happening here is that a staker who has previously deposited funds uh, into Eigenlayer uh, essentially updates a pointer in the core contracts saying that some operator now has um, been delegated your funds so that they can operate on it. They can use those funds to secure uh, some services. So what happens after staker deposits funds, operators offer the resources and stakers have delegated funds. Now these operators um, end up um, actively validating services, which is uh, the name of the next actor. And what ABSs are, uh, earlier on, we said they're just apps. And yeah, these apps are some combination of on-chain and off-chain code. It accepts operators who are interested in performing the service and rewards them for the service. Now, um, what are the on-chain components of an ABS? Um, the on-chain components of an ABS, uh, the, the primary entry point for how Eigenlayer recognizes an ABS uh, is called the service manager. And, and this is the, the, the function that, um, ex that the core contracts accepts a bunch of calls from to, uh, you know, as, as operators are registering to an AVS, uh, they're re deregistering, the stakes are being updated, et cetera. Um, service manager um, is, is aware of that. Um, so yeah, moving on here, this is just so that the AVS directory uh, is aware of uh, an AVS uh, essentially registering and then for any off-chain code to index the registration of the ABS um, from the ABS directory. And when operator registration is happening, um, is, uh, this is the call that um, gets made, register a operator to ABS, which uh, the service manager defines so that it can take on that registration from the operator. And this is a function that is uh, implemented, uh, that is specified in the interface for service manager base, which, which, which we'll go through um, in, a, in a little bit. As you can see um, in the option code, you have this operator who makes this registration call to the service manager of the EBS contracts, who then checks uh, with the EBS directory whether the operator that tried to register is in fact an operator. So this, thing's, this distinction you can, you can see is uh, there's a set of core contracts, as we said, and some ABS contracts, the, the primary one being the service manager. But in, in a little bit, we're going to go through how you can expand to have other contracts that provide the various different functionality for stake, uh, utilities like signature checking, verification, and, and things of that nature. And uh, for option code, um, we say that it's any code that is not running on, on an Ethereum L1 mainnet um, contract. And we say that because. Um, you can end up running chains uh, as an ABS. So that ends up becoming essentially some code that, 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 that um, defines logic for a chain being run. So technically you could say that that's on-chain, but that's not what we um, refer, to it, refer to it as. Here, um, it can be a chain, it can be a, a coprocessor, it can be a real-time data feed in Oracle, it can be anything else. So off-chain is just the code that the, that the ABS operators um, running or running um, it's, it's the code that developers uh, produce uh, for the operators to run. In terms of how you can think about ABS contracts, um, 
these are the three that we mentioned earlier. And this is the other one that, that I was talking about earlier um, with the service manager base implementing some, some uh, basic functionality. And if you look at the repositories uh, later on um, for Fragon Layer, there is a repo that's called middleware. That repo is the one that has all these contracts that are specific to, to an ABS. And it covers things like the registry coordinator, state registry, index registry, uh, and, and, and a few others. And the thing we want to highlight here is that you don't necessarily need all of the ABS contracts above to design or implement your ABS. The first three, um, these ones, the service manager base, registry coordinator, and stake registry will probably end up being very useful to you because they implement some common operations. But as long as you have implemented the interface for a service manager, um, that's how you can define how your stake is handled um, and how um, I can layer core, uh, the core protocol just recognizes what, what your um, ABS is trying to do. But um, uh, yeah, in, in, this, in this section, we're, we're going to cover how these contracts may be useful to you and when an operator opts into your ABS, what that means in terms of them helping secure your ABS with a specific security profile. Right. So like I mentioned, um, this is the reference implementation of a base contract that can be used. Um, it's the address by which I can there recognizes your ABS. And the current um, functionality that, that it provides is registration and deregistration conditions for your operators. So um, yeah, this is the interface, register, deregister. And, and these two are, are um, function signatures that we're going to dive into a little bit later, but we can skip over them now. Um, but if, yeah, uh, the, 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 why is the interface concerned with these two? Yeah, we'll cover that in the next section. So we care about strategies for an ABS, as mentioned earlier, because they're the tokens or the assets that um, you deposit, or it, it's how the it's how I can layer recognizes assets, right? Um, so these operators are delegated some of these assets, and when these fun, uh, and with these funds, these operators register with the ABSs to secure the operations of these, AB of these ABSs. But when we say that, what do we exactly mean, and how does it happen? So registration with stake to an ABS happens through, through the interface of what we call quorums. And quorums is just some grouping or configuration of a specific kind of stake that an ABS has. So when an operator is opting into uh, an ABS, they specify a specific um, set of quorums. And these quorums are the things that ABSs end up defining. So you can have CBEs, native ETH, or any configuration of the other assets that are currently um, recognized by, by Eigenlayer. And as the developer of the AVS, this is what you, this is how you can uh, end up defining the security profile that you want to accept from operators. Um, so moving on, uh, yeah. The specific definition of this is just the strategy, as we mentioned earlier. And we have a field called the multiplier. And all it is, is um, it gives you, as a developer, the preference to weigh a specific asset differently to another asset that you want to um, specify, right? So let's say you have STE and the multiplier for that is, is five. And let's say you have CBE and the multiplier for that is like three, right? So you give a um, relative um, preference for, for the assets that, that you want to um, secure your ABS. And here we have a more concrete example of, of how that looks like. But yeah, you can you can go through this a little bit later. Um, and yeah, so the purpose of having a quorum is that ABS can recognize the makeup of its security profile. But now, because of that, there exists this relationship between um, what the operators are, what their stake is, and how ABS is defined the security they want from these operators via quorums, right? So we because this is such a common operation um, and this relationship is core to the functionality um, of an ABS and the contracts, we've ended up creating a few registry contracts that help with the accounting um, involved in this relationship. And these are the stake registry and the index registry. And if you're using BLS as part of your operations, uh, that's what the BLS APK registry um, can be used for. And this is something that we can cover in, in the later sections. 
But now, since we have a few different registries that help our service manager state, both operator and stake state, we need a way to consistently interact with these registries. And that's the point of the coordinator of, of, of these registries, which, end up be, which ends up being called the, the registry coordinator. And the reference implementation of, of this uh, registry coordinator that we have um, includes the SAKE registry, index registry, and the BLS APK registry. So the way that this is currently defined, because quorums are such a core concept for how ABSs work, the registry coordinator becomes the primary entry point for handling quorum updates. And this means pushing these updates to all the registries that it's tracking. And because of that, um, it's the contract that keeps track of quorums, uh, which exists and, and the ones that have been initialized. So when you look at uh, the registry coordinator in, in the middle of repo, you will see how um, quorums are specified and things like, um, yeah, a great quorum or, or any other sort of common operation that revolves around quorums are, are, are defined in the registry coordinator. So moving on. Um, yes, uh, and because of this, it is also the primary entry point for operators as a registered to register from an ABS um, through the quorums. As specified here, yeah. So um, as we said earlier, operators uh, specify which which quorums out of all the quorums that the ABS has defined they want to opt into and with some other parameters such as the operator signature this function takes up that functionality and that's a lot of the basics uh, that you should know um, if you end up looking at the other contracts like the stake registry like the index, index registry the nat spec comments are very well defined to give you a sense of all the exact parameters that, that are um, needed and what they're trying to do. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the group chat. But from this point on, I'd like to give a brief overview of the repo that we put together with a bunch of resources for how you can think about high level concepts around building AVSs and some of the videos and walkthroughs, as well as um, some development guides like the Hello World ABS that another is going to go through and the incredible squaring ABS that Sam is going to go through. But more specifically, there's also references here in terms of how other projects have defined their contracts and their off-chain code and how their off-chain code does what it does to interact with the state that lives on chain. So yeah, this is a this is a great resource for, for everyone to, to check out for that. And Having said all that, I will pass it over to Nader. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, what we're going to be doing at the end of this, by the way, is having a Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, note them. And then when we're getting towards the end, you'll have an opportunity for us to answer as many questions as we can with the amount of time that we have. So we're going to go ahead and jump on to the next part of this. I'm going to be presenting now a Hello World ABS, which is kind of the most simple ABS that you can imagine. And I'm going to share my screen. All right. So uh, it looks like I am sharing. So that's great. What I'm going to go ahead and show you first is this repo here. And this is in the repo that was shared earlier from NEMA. It's one of the different repos within the Awesome ABS. So if you have that Awesome ABS, you'll see that this is part of that or you can just go to the Layer Labs GitHub and you'll see Hello World ABS. So this is the, the ABS that we're gonna be running here. And I think like when, if you've never done anything, it might be a good place to start just to kind of get to mental model of how all this stuff works together. What we're gonna do is we're gonna walk through the contracts and also the different commands to run this and we're gonna run it locally. And this is the design of this. It's very, very simple. All we're doing is verifying a string message, which is hello world. And from there, you can kind of like expand this to do, you know, more complex stuff. Um, I think the presentation that Sam is going to give is going to be, you know, moving 
more towards what a real world use case would look like, where this is more of just say, okay, I want to understand how to interact with the contracts, what a service might look like and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the code. So this is the Hello World AVS. And there's you know quite a bit of code and a lot, a lot of different folders and stuff. But in reality, there's only four, I would say, files that you really need to worry about to understand what's happening here. The make file defines all of the different tasks or commands that you can run to kind of start this up. And then we have the actual AVS smart contract, which is in the contracts slash SRC folder. And it's called Hello World Service Manager. This, this service manager has everything that you need to you know, operate this AVS. So you don't have to jump between 100 files. There's a lot of files, but you know you, you really only need to worry about these four. Uh, so the contracts are you know, interacting with the eigenlayer contracts, but the specific functionality for this is all here in this Hello World. And then we have our off-chain stuff, which is a TypeScript uh, slash JavaScript project. And we have an index.ts and a create new tasks ts, which we're gonna like walk through all of this right now. So the general idea is we if you want to start this AVS, we can go here to the make file and kind of see that we have really these commands here that would be either building and running this yourself or running this from an existing state. So the, the two options you would have here would to be um, if you wanted to kind of run an AVS yourself, you would build your contracts, you would start Anvil, um, you would then deploy the eigenlayer contracts to, in, to, to your uh, local node, then you would deploy your um, uh, uh, specific AVS contracts to the local network, and then you would uh, register your operator, and then you would run your AVS. Um, we have a single command that basically does all of that with an existing state, and that's kind of what we're going to be running. But if you wanted to kind of uh, run that yourself and do that yourself, you could actually jump into these commands here, and you can kind of see uh, exactly what's going on in these different files here. But if we go to the readme, it outlines exactly what you need to run this ABS. There's really only three commands to get started. This starts the local Anvil node, which is like your local network, and deploys the chain with some uh, some pre-existing state, which would be as if you kind of walked through and did all that yourself. Then we make then we then we start the operator, which is the off-chain uh, service, and then we start sending requests to the service that then verifies the data on chain. Um, and I'm gonna jump and answer some of these questions, but the, I'll just answer one real quick. Why do we need Anvil? Well, you can either test against like hard hat network locally or Anvil network. It doesn't really matter. Um, we have chosen for uh, Foundry as our development environment for a lot of our examples, but it doesn't have to be that way. It might be cool to see someone build an AVS example with hard hat. Um, you know, you typically are going to uh, test locally on a local network. And then you might deploy to our test network when you're ready to kind of get closer to production, which is Holsky. And then you might deploy to mainnet when you're ready to go live. So the reason we're using Anvil is just a test network, but you could also use any other um, test network, I guess. So um, we want to walk through the code, but before we do that, let's go ahead and actually just start the network. So the command that we're going to do to go ahead and start the, the network and deploy our uh, all of our contracts and everything is this make command, make start chain with contracts deployed. And this does everything that you need to kind of set up Eigenlayer locally, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's kind of doing a lot under the hood, but it's just like literally you're deploying um, the Eigenlayer contracts. You have your um, your actual AVS contracts deployed and everything ready to roll. And then you can just run your service, which is gonna be the TypeScript project. So um, we've deployed the contracts and, and everything like that. So let's jump into the code to kind of understand what's going, what's going on. So the entry point to this application is this main function. And main just calls this function here. 
And here you see two things that are going on. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. We're first registering our operator with Eigenlayer. And then we are setting up this monitor to, uh, new tasks, which is essentially watching for contract events. Someone asked uh, if this is going to be recorded. Yes, this will be recorded. Um, so the main function is registering the tasks. And when a new task uh, happens, um, then we'll be like listening for it in this, this uh, function here. Um, to understand what's what's happening with the actual tasks, let's go to the Hello World Service Manager. Here you see a bunch of uh, imports from Eigenlayer. I wouldn't worry about like diving into all of that right now. There's really only a couple of um, uh, functions here. I would say two that we need to really worry about. Uh, we're creating a task and then we're responding to a task. So the create new task is us actually having like a custom function within our contract that is kind of specific to this AVS. And what we're doing is just keeping a registry of all the tasks that have been happening and a data structure. So we keep like the task name, when uh, the block that was, uh, that the task was created. And then we keep up with like an index of how many tasks have been created. And, and we just store that uh, in, you know, in, our, in, our, in our local state. And then what happens when a new task is created is that we emit this new task created event. And that is what is picked up here in our service. So when a new task is created, we're gonna emit the event from our contract. It's gonna catch in this listener here. And then we're gonna call this uh, sign and re respond to task. Okay, so out of everything that we're looking at, the two most important things I think for you to understand like with how an AVS work are gonna be this sign and respond to task function and how it's handled in the actual smart contract. So let's take a look at that now because this is actually the verification that is happening. So what we're gonna be getting in as an argument here is this task and the task is gonna have a name. So we'll have some like, you know, arbitrary information coming in to, as an argument here. And then we're going to verify that arbitrary information by calling sign and respond to task. Sign and respond to task is this function right here. So sign and respond to task, we uh, create a message and we basically are going to sign that message. And then we call the, uh, I can, uh, the AVS contract contract dot respond to task passing in our information along with our signature and then we wait for this to succeed and if we go to our hello world service manager what we're going to be looking for is this respond to task function and respond to task right here is doing the abs verification so we're going to have a bunch of checks so this would be kind of like your verification your on-chain verification for your custom or, or your whatever your AVS that you're building, you would have your own custom verification that you would do here. But for, for this basic example, we're checking that the operator has met a minimum set of requirements. We are making sure that the task uh, that, that we're passing in hasn't already been recorded and that we haven't already responded to that task. And if all of those things check out, we then go ahead and update the local list of tasks with the new task and add that, we append that to our local data structure. And then we emit a task uh, responded event. And that's about it. And then what you could also do, I guess, is like in this, uh, you know, main function or this monitor new task function, you could also do like a listener for this event as well, but we're not really uh, listening for that event. The only event that we're listening for is new task created. So if we want to go ahead and run that, uh, we have the the Anvil node running, but we haven't we haven't started our service. So I'm going to go ahead and start the service here. So this is going to go ahead and um, I need to go ahead and actually install the dependencies. So we're going to go ahead and call make start operator. This is going to go ahead and register the operator and 
we're now listening uh, for new tasks. And if we go to this last file here, this is going to just call an interval where we create a new task every, uh, we had it set up for every 15 seconds, but let's bring in that out into like five seconds. So every five seconds, we're gonna create a random name. We're gonna create a new task. The task is going to be created here in our contract. from this uh, interval. So we'll create the task. We have the listener set up here. It's gonna then sign and respond to the task. And uh, that's just gonna happen every five seconds. So that's the general idea. So to test this out, we're gonna go ahead and run this last command, which is make spam tasks, which is just gonna start this, uh, this service, which creates a new task every five seconds. And I'm running into an issue, but let me just see one thing real quick. Oh, it looks like I've added an X somewhere. Let's try that again. All right, so now we're monitoring new tasks. We're creating a new task every five seconds, which what we should see here is that a new task gets detected and we're gonna sign and respond to the task. And as long as everything goes well, we should not see any errors. And now we have a basic, very basic uh, service running. So if you want to go th back through that and uh, understand it you know, better by taking your time and, and reading through that code a little bit more, I definitely recommend checking out this Hello World AVS and hopefully between Neiman's presentation, this presentation, and then Sam's presentation, which is going to be a little bit more in depth, um, you'll have a good understanding around like the different moving pieces within an ABS. And just one quick call out, uh, we have an actual SDK that you can use to, to more easily in, in, interact with the eigenlayer contracts. It's written in Go. What we've done in this ABS is we're literally just using ethers or some other, you can use any obviously RPC, uh, connection library to just make calls directly to eigenlayer contracts. Um, but we also have a Go SDK if, you, if you're you know writing Go. We're working on getting other SDKs. We'd like to see TypeScript, Python, and Rust as well in the future. But for now, uh, the only SDK we have is Go. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand it off to Sam. Awesome. Thanks, Nader. All right. So I've got roughly 15 minutes. I'll try to... I mean, this was an, honestly an awesome introduction. I don't think I can do much better than Natter. Natter's like an expert at this. He's very eloquent. <laughs> I'll do my best. I basically wrote Incredible Scoring like roughly a year ago um, after joining Eigenlayer. And I also kind of, we were, I'm also mostly working on the Eigen SDK and, and building a, a bunch of tooling. So definitely if you guys have issues with anything, please, you can reach out and we'll try to help. Um, so let me share my screen. Yeah, I think one thing to go over might be the signature stuff because I kind of didn't talk about that at all. Um, sure, there's two kind of main ways to do signing, and I think Sam can explain it in a more concrete way than me. Does this work? Yes. Okay, great. All right, yeah, so this is the Incredible Scoring AVS repo. Um, so it'll look and feel very similar to Hello World. This one is written in Golang um, instead of TypeScript. But uh, a lot of the kind of make file and deployment flows um, and all of the scripts that you'll see for, for deploying and starting the Anvil chain and loading the, the already deployed contracts will be very similar. Um, right, so you'll have the make start Anvil chain. Uh, you can start an aggregator. I'll explain what the aggregator is. Um, so you have all of these commands. So if I switch over to the actual repo here, there's a make file, which I like to give help commands like this. If you just type make, you'll see all of the different commands. So you can like play with this and go into depth in different sections. So all the contracts, how they're built, how they're deployed. You can have fun with these and look in the make file what exactly they're running. The Docker, there's a few things. Um, CLI for registering your operator, uh, deregistering, depositing, all of this stuff. And then actually starting the off-chain software is here. Um, so that's that. 
Now, what exactly is incredible scoring doing? Um, incredible scoring is basically like the simplest coprocessor that you could ever have. So if we look at the architecture diagram here, um, there's two, the, the on, uh, on chain section here, you have the eigenlayer contracts and the AVS contracts. Um, AVS contract being incredible scoring contracts. Um, so there's a tax generator, again, like Natter was showing here, instead of, uh, of sending like strings and asking for hello, uh, hello person to be printed, it's sending integers and asking for their squared to be credibly submitted back on chain. Um, but the mental model you should have is that this also scales to any kind of crazy computation that is too expensive to, to compute on, on Ethereum. So for example, the if you can think uh, about some AI coprocessor, right? So you would basically send a request for, um, for some input to be passed through some huge LLM models uh, and that would be done credibly. So that's kind of the mental model you should have for incredible squaring. Um, so the task is sent on the contract and then there's an event that's emitted, um, picked up by the eigenlayer operators. Um, the idea here is that there should be more than one uh, as opposed to hello world. Uh, they sign on the task. I'll get into this whole BLS signature uh, signing in a little bit that Nader was mentioning, but they, they each sign using a BLS signature, well, a BN254 signature, which is aggregating using the BLS uh, scheme by the aggregator here. So the aggregator is literally just aggregating a BLS signature. Um, I'll get into this uh, again a little bit uh, in a few minutes. And then once the aggregator has a, a complete, like a signature uh, that meets the quorum threshold that is asked for. So basically we ask, oh, okay, I want 80%. When a task uh, is submitted on chain, you say, I will consider a task completed if it's signed by at least, you know, 80% or 66% or whatever of uh, the signers um, of the stake of, that the operators own. So as soon as you meet this threshold, you can send the, the answer on chain. And then the user, the person who submitted a task, uh, will take the output uh, of that LLM, right? Or in this case, the output of the, the square number. Um, and that's now on, the answer is now on chain and he can use it, uh, pull it in its own contract or whatever. Um, so that's the general idea. Um, there's more detail into what exactly is happening. Um, and there's like a UML diagram here that I don't think is worth going into detail, but basically this is like exactly what's happening in the Golang code. Um, and then later, if you actually want to build an, an AVS, there's the AVS node spec compliance. So there, there's some requirements that if you, for the off-chain uh, software that needs to be met so that operators that are running the software kind of have a, a unified experience. And, you know, if they're deploying on Kubernetes or whatever, they, at least they have these endpoints that they know they can rely on and these metrics that they know they can have. Um, so it's kind of to, to give a unified experience. So we'll only be adding things to here right now. It, it's pretty simple and it's not super extensive what we're requiring. Um, okay, I think that's the gist of it. So I'll try to touch a bit right now upon this uh, BLS signature aggregation before I, I, I go more into detail um, in the code. Um, okay, so so the idea with the hello world is you have a single operator that is signing off on the on the responses. So when when the a string is submitted on chain, then there's a single operator that operator that Natter was was running that which just picks up the string and then it uh, it it sends back hello string uh, to the contract. Um, so the idea with Eigenlayer is Eigenlayer is a delegated proof of stake system. So any um, commitment or any response that is sent on chain is basically the economic security backing that task is only the amount of stake that uh, that operator has delegated to it, right? Um, so the idea of Eigenlayer is again, it works as a, a you can think of it as a, a bit of a, like an optimistic rollup where um, the stake is shared by all the AVSs. Um, and, and so the idea is that uh, there needs to be a slashing uh, condition that is encoded in the contract, which if the operator lies, um, then he can get slashed, right? So basically any answer that I send back to the contract, the point is its guarantee is only good insofar as the, the amount of money that is backing that claim. Um, and so as a user, as the task generator here, if I send a, uh, uh, if I send a request, and then I say, okay, whatever. If one operator signs off on the task, I'm happy. I'll, I'll accept the, the output. Um, then maybe an operator with a very small amount of stake can just sign off and, and, and lie and send a, a fake response. So now what we want is we just want a lot of operators to, to basically we want to aggregate a lot of economic security, right? So we want as many operators as possible to, to, to replicate the same computation and sign off on their answer. Um, the problem with ECDSA signatures um, is that each of them is, uh, so 64 bytes, I think, the signature for an ECDSA signature. Um, and so if you 
kind of if, if you have a thousand operators then each of them has like you you can just see that the signature becomes really big because it's two 64 bytes for each operator um and also when you send it back on chain then it's like a multi-sig so you'll need to verify each of these uh, signatures one after the other um so the idea for bls signature which is by the way the same thing that the beacon chain on ethereum uses is um it, basically your signatures are uh, an element on the elliptic curve and you can add the signatures together um so it's like literally the group element on the elliptic curve. So if you have uh, a thousand of these signatures that are the 64 bytes each, you can literally just add them. Um, and you, you end up with one aggregated signature, which is just 64 bytes, but it actually contains the information um, of a hundred signers. And so the aggregator basically takes these, just aggregates them and sends them on chain. And then there's a way for the, the, the contract to verify um, uh, using a pairing. So if you've seen like there's some, uh, there's pairings being added as pre-compiled contract on uh, on uh, on Ethereum. Um, so the ones that were on the chain were only the ones for verifying BM two fifty four signatures, which is what we're currently using. Um, now there's BLS uh, twelve three eighty one, which is just another elliptic curve, which is being added so that we can verify stuff from the, the beacon chain. Um, right now, all of our tooling uh, is using the BM two fifty four, so that's what we use. So. So it can be a bit confusing, but basically it's BLS signatures over the BN254 curve. It's not BLS signatures over the BLS12381 curve, which is what Ethereum uses. Um, so that's most of our, our AVS are using like EigenDA, incredible squaring. Um, there's there's nothing stopping from using BLS12381, especially now that that means soon enough there will be the, the pre-compiles for verifying them. Um, but yeah, th that will be another option. So, okay, so now the question is, when would you want to use ECSA uh, signatures versus BLS? And then it's just a, a trade-off of basically of, of gas costs. So if you verify one ECDSA signature, you need to do an EC recover um, opcode, which costs 3,000 gas. So, you know, if you have like 10 operators, then it's going to cost you 30,000 gas. Um, whereas, so a BLS signature, you need to use the a pairing so that it's one of the pre-compiles. I think, I forget off the top of my head, but I think it's at least like 100,000 gas like base cost just for verifying the pairing right so you know already that you need to have at least 30 operators before you, you want to switch to bls signatures so basically there, there's kind of a threshold i think it's somewhere around 30 to 40 operators or if you have if your abs has below that then it's probably not worth using bls signatures first of all because they're a lot more complicated you'll see if you read the code for the verifying the signatures of hello world compared to to, to incredible scoring um incredible scoring is way more complicated um effectively it's it's using the same the same tooling that we've built for EigenDA and that we're using there. So uh, it's definitely a lot more involved. Um, so with that being said, I can show some of the code. So again, I'll, I'll, I'll do a very quick demo like Nader did. Um, also, I'm not looking at the chat because I'm sharing my entire screen. Nader, if there's questions that you... We're going to take questions um, after this is over. Okay, awesome. So then I'll just do... How much time do I have? I'm pretty much done, right? But... I wouldn't worry about time. We have, um, I mean, it's up to you, but I think we have up until 15 minutes after the hour, but depending on okay. your schedule. I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, this is a quick demo, so I'll just, so the, the same thing here. So here we need to start the aggregator first. Um, I think you can also start the operator, um, but basically the aggregator here acts both as the aggregator and also as the task generator, just because we didn't want to implement another thing. So it's also periodically, I think every 10 seconds or something, sending another, a new number to be squared to the to the contract. Um, so right now there's no operator running, so nobody's listening for 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 any number and, and not answering. Um, so if we start the operator the same way that uh, that Natter did here, um, so typically you would want to use the CLI to go register your operator, um, but in these uh, simple examples we've made it so that when the when the operator start, it just like dynamically registers. So the operator is registering. There's yeah, with the, there's still some cleaning up that we need to do on, on some of the logs here. But um, okay, so there we go. So so you see the threshold reached. Okay, I'll try to stop it at someone. But yeah, threshold reached sending aggregated response on chain. So okay, what's happening? Basically, you'll see here. Um, let me stop this. Let's stop this. Um, so if we go up. Um, Okay, so there we go. So let's say here, the operator received a new task. Um, so the quorum threshold percentage, the number to be squared is five, and then the quorum numbers 
uh, we can go into detail if you guys have questions, but um, this is the meta info related to the number that I need to be squared. And then uh, the the operator just goes and squares the, the number, signs off on it using its BN254 um, uh, private key, and then sends the, the signed task response to the aggregator. Then first here, you'll see this is normal. It says uh, received error from aggregator. Uh, task five, not initialized or already completed. Um, this is normal is just because the events are basically, because we're on Anvil chain locally, the operator um, receives the, the event, um, signs off, uh, basically computes the square and signs off on it and then sends it to the aggregator faster than the aggregator can uh, create its, its sort of aggregation structures that it needs to create in order to just even like uh, have accounting on which operators have which stake at that block. So the aggregator needs to do a bit of accounting first. So it needs to build some data structures before it, it, it can start aggregating. Um, and the operator so it sends the response too fast. Um, and the aggregator just says, okay, I'm not ready. So either here, the task five not initialized. So the operator just retries a few times in the second. So they're retrying in two seconds. And then here, okay, here it, it fails again. And then after four seconds, this last try actually works. Aggregator accepts it. And then the aggregator sends uh, the answer on chain. So here there's a single operator. So the we've met the threshold. And I think the threshold was 100 when we sent the, yeah. So it means I, 100 just means I, I will accept the, a signature on chain uh, once 100% of the, the stake has signed off on the task. So here there's a single operator. So basically, uh, just need that operator to sign. Um, but in the in there's a Docker example where we have two operators running, um, and you can scale that to n, and then uh, you can play with the threshold, saying, for example, oh, I'll accept if there's 80% of of uh, stakes uh, signing and such things. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, I don't really want to go into the contracts. Um, if, if there's like questions, we can we can go into the contracts. But the, um, we've so we've separated it very briefly into a, a service manager and a task manager. Um, the service manager is the most important thing. Is the it's the contract that Eigenlayer knows about. The task manager here is just a separate contract for, for accounting reason, just to keep basically the semantics different. Service manager deals with mostly with the slashing logic, whereas uh, the task manager deals with the kind of responses and, and, and making sure that the number squared is, uh, is is actually the number squared and you know keeping track of the task responses and the indexing on chain. Um, so that's mainly it, like it, it's pretty simple. Um, the one thing I wanted to show, which, um, so there's a, I forget what it's called, checks, BLS signature checker. This is the main contract where the, the BLS signature logic is, is encoded. So every time you submit a task to the contract, the contract will, so you can see here, for example, in the task manager, uh, oh, this is not the one. So the task manager is a, a BLS signature checker. So basically every AVS that uses BLS signatures, um, or at least uses our, the tooling that we've built, which is a lot of the AVSs, um, basically the service manager implements this BLS signature checker, which has a function verify signature or something, or check signature, check signature. Yeah, this function right here. Um, and then this is the function that basically verifies that the, that the, the BLS signature is correct. So this is super involved. It took me a long time in the beginning to actually parse and figure out what's here. So I won't even try to do it right now. All I want to show is that this, this non-signer stake and signature struct is what you need basically is the meta information that the aggregator is, is aggregating and building in order to, to convince the contract that the signature is correct. So you need, for example, APK is the aggregate public key on G2, Sigma is the signature, then you have the quorum APK. So for each quorum, as, as uh, uh, Nemo was talking about earlier, you have different quorums for different uh, tokens. So it, sometimes you'll want different uh, tokens to, the stake of different tokens of different quorums to have met their threshold, each of them. So, so that's just even more complexity. And then if there are non-signers, you also need to give their pub key such that you can subtract them from the aggregated pub key that is cached on chain. There's just a lot going on. Um, so, I think it's it, it's one of the better uh, kind of we were the first to actually implement BLS signatures um, verification on chain, and I think we probably have the most optimized library um, as far as I know. So this is really really a good playground if you want to learn more about BLS signatures um, and how they're verified on chain. Um, so definitely do ask questions and go go super dive into this as much as you can and ask questions, and we'll be happy to help.
I think I'll stop here, Netter. Awesome. Thank you uh, for that. That was really great. Uh, I want to know, like, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the um, chat here. And maybe we'll get to a few that we haven't been, haven't been answered quite yet. But I have a quick question about the incredible squaring myself that um, I'm not a thousand percent sure about because it's actually I remember it was the first ABS that I looked at and I'm not uh, that familiar with Go. And it was, you know, a lot of code for me to, to parse. So for the verification of the number, is there any actual like logic in the verification um, contract to calculate that number or is it instead just relying on all of the operators to come to an agreement and then they verify that they've all had the same answer? Right. Um, so in, in this case, the slashing condition in the contract would just be like, you can literally square a number easily in solidity. So the slashing condition in this case is just like, oh, if, if so if all of these operators have signed off on a number that is not the square, then the slashing condition is just, okay, I'll send the number, I'll actually square it in solidity, I'll prove that it's oh, okay. different. So it's going to actually like compare the result off-chain to, to actually doing the work on-chain to make sure that it matches right. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So th this is basically al always what you want. So that's the difference between objective slashing conditions and then subjective slashing conditions. Subjective is things like oracles or something that you can't, you can't verify on-chain because the information was you know, something like uh, at a specific time time shot in a different database that the on-chain doesn't have access to, as in the case of an Oracle that's just pulling data, let's say from, so you can't kind of go back and be like, oh, this was the actual answer. Whereas for all of the objective slashing conditions, so even for example, like a huge LLM, something that can't be computed on-chain, you like mo like the, the best way to, to have an objective slashing condition is you'll, you'll create a ZK proof. So a lot of these, a lot of these ABSs, um, are just backed by a ZK fraud proof. So the, the ZK is, is more expensive than verifying BLS signatures. So optimistically, you'll just um, verify the, the BLS signatures and kind of trust the operators. But it's actually there's actually it's actually backed by economic security and not just trust based because if they ever lie, you can you can send submit a, a ZK fraud proof um, and, and prove that they lied and then slash their stakes. So. That that's actually really helpful. Okay, very cool. Um, we have a question here. May I know the exact part where you might need to write something and go? Do you want to take this one there? I mean, I guess this is going to be, I mean, that's a very open-ended question because really all of the, you know, custom functionality that you are implementing in your AVS is going to be written off-chain and it's just going to be verified within that contract. So that's kind of up to you. And it, it could either be Go, it can be TypeScript, it can be Python, it could literally be anything, anything that can run, you know, in a service. So just any web web service you could you could think of. Um, so that's going to be completely up to you in terms of the type of, uh, I guess, verification that you're trying to kind of implement in your ABS. Yeah. Yep. And if there are any other questions, feel free to drop them in. If not, we might wrap it up in just a minute. Yeah, I guess John Doe to answer your question. Uh, you need to think of an AVS as kind of the opposite, I guess. So an AVS developer would be the opposite of what a smart contract engineer would be. So the smart contract engineer is kind of taking the whole Ethereum blockchain as it's like, you know, it's DevOps teams and it only has to write code that runs on chain um, An AVS. An AVS developer would be the opposite. So it's someone who actually writes like kind of off-chain first and they're thinking about, oh, I'm going to build a bridge or I'm going to build like some AI model or something. Um, the chain is there to secure that off-chain service, that off-chain computation. So basically it's the slashing conditions that are encoded on chain most of the time. Or sometimes if it's a bridge, you know, there's like the, the finality or the settlement will happen on chain. But it's kind of, you need to think about it as off-chain first, right? It's like you're providing a service that, I mean, you're, sent, you're sometimes moving also information between blockchains, but but it's kind of something off-chain happening first as opposed to, to the other way around. Okay, cool. Well, I think that that will wrap it up. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to drop them in the, the um, hackathon chat. And if you are watching this later on YouTube, feel free to drop them in YouTube. We'll try to, you know, try to keep up with any questions that we have there. And thanks everyone for checking this out. And we will go ahead and end this now. Thanks, Sam. Awesome.